Hey, Changemakers, welcome to our podcast, The Best Version of Myself, where we bring on changemakers that we believe are living exactly that, the best version of themselves day after day, and they continue to hone their best version to live the best life that they can. I'll be the best version of myself, spreading kindness and peace. Today we have with us Allegra Johnson. Welcome, Allegra. Thank you so much. Allegra is our Mindful Education in the Schools Director at Challenge to Change Incorporated and is dedicated to spreading the simple and powerful tools of mindfulness to people of all ages. Allegra holds her master's degree in social work and has previously worked as a mental health professional for adults. In her current role at Challenge to Change, she focuses on the implementation of mindfulness programs in schools and creating spaces for youth to develop and practice preventative tools to make their wor- themselves and their world a more peaceful place to be. Mm-hmm. Allegra, I'm so grateful to have you on the podcast the best version of myself to talk all things yoga and mindfulness and mindful education with you, but most importantly, to talk about the Eightfold Path of Yoga, but most specifically, the Yamas and the Niyamas. So Allegra, let's begin telling listeners first about you and who you are Mm -hmm. and what brought you to yoga and what brought you to Challenge to Change. Take it away, Allegra. Sounds good. Well, thanks so much for having me. I'm so excited to talk about the Yamas and Niyamas. Um, Two kind of parallel stories, I guess, of what brought me to yoga, and then almost the same thing happening to what brought me to Challenge to Change. So I started doing yoga in college, and yoga came to me in a time where I was experiencing a lot of transition. Richard Rohr is a a teacher of mine, his writings, and he talks about this uh, order, disorder, and reorder that people often go through this cyclical, very like uh, resurrection kind of idea of we cling to order, to black and white, and then there's disorder that disrupts that comfortability, and then we have this beautiful reorder, and that's like where growth happens. I love that. I've never heard that before. Say that one more time. Yeah. Order disorder and reorder um and i i just love that um that idea that metaphor it came to me at a time where as a youth you're going through all these identity shifts and um particularly i was just experiencing a lot of a lot of guilt from really clinging to this black and white yeah seeing all these things my world opening up learning about new ideas um and just wanting so deeply to be a good person and feeling a lot of just like overwhelming kind of ick about what the world was and um, I think a lot of young people go through that and so yoga came to me at a time when I was waking up every day and really just trying to remember that I'm doing the best that I can that I'm growing to be the best version of myself but was struggling to to really feel that Um, and so the practice of yoga was brought to me by a counselor and just helped me to embody so many things that I wanted to embody and particularly with self-love. So I um, started practicing yoga daily. It became really, really important to me getting out of kind of a dark time in my life and um, just has been with me ever since. So That's amazing. So you were already in the work of social work? No, Mm -hmm. this is back when I was an undergrad. Undergrad, okay. And what was your major during that time? Social work as well. Okay, social work was. Okay, absolutely. And that really brought you into the practice. And then you went and got your master's degree. I did. Correct, from Clark University? Yep. Okay, and social work as well. And then were you? did you continue practicing the physical practice of yoga? I did continue yeah. practicing, yeah. And what I loved about my work as a mental health professional was the way that mindfulness was so embedded in yeah. so many of the therapy modalities that I was using with clients. And so the breath in particular was something that, ooh, I don't think I would have had really any sessions if I wasn't um, willing and able to enter into a space of mindfulness with my clients. And so... Um, from that, from some burnout, and just really knowing that my call was not to be a mental health professional, even though it's what I really wanted, um, getting my degree, that is, I I knew that I 
I needed to do something with mindfulness and with um, bringing people to themselves, bringing people home to themselves. Right. Um, and it was actually my partner, David, that just one day when I was particularly upset and sad was like, Allegra, like you got to do like kids yoga. And then it, it light bulb went Thank off. Thank you, David. That's right. And I was like, okay, this woman named Molly came to my graduate uh, class yeah, and did to, this when lesson. Jamie was your instructor yeah, at Clark. Yeah, okay. Yep. Yes. So just like, well, gosh, what could be more fun than doing that? So yeah. applied for a job and here I am. And here you are. Yeah. Full time making mm-hmm. waves big time in our mindful education in the schools program. So you really came to the practice of yoga around the age of where you're guiding kids. Cause yeah, a, a main absolutely. focus of what you do is with our secondary students mm-hmm. and um, you work with all levels of students. Now you do a lot of our scheduling for our teachers and whatnot. Yeah, so yeah. that's, you know, you're really working with a lot of people's mental health there as well. For sure. <laughs> and it, I mean, it certainly has lended me just to even kind of overseeing our team as well right. or just um, hoping in all aspects of my life to build relationships um, in which people can encounter themselves in like a really full and meaningful way. But yeah, absolutely. High yeah. schoolers have been my jam. I love working with them. Yeah. And you know, you have transitioned in your role a little bit mm-hmm. into really being the assistant director and helping Jordan a lot. Jordan Turner, who was on one of our previous podcasts, who's our mindful education in the school's director. Mm-hmm. And You know, throughout that transition, something that you've mentioned to me was wanting to get your 200 yoga certification, and you recently did that at Body and Soul. Can you talk a little bit about your experience in your 200? Oh my gosh, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, so got my 200 at Body and Soul, and it was just a really, really incredibly transformative um, practice and time to not only grow in my comfortability. I mean, I was teaching teens yoga and was a daily practitioner myself, but really connecting, I think, the other aspects of yoga, because it's not just a physical practice, um, to my life. And I think it has certainly made um, my teaching come alive and made what is the mission of Challenge Change come come to life. Yeah. When I am able to teach it for adults, for kids, um, even just with myself. So... Yeah. So I may be cheating a little bit because I do know your noble goal, but I yeah. know that a big part of your noble goal is spreading peace. Mm-hmm. Um, and you have found through your 200 and through your noble goal, like a deep rooted love for the yamas and niyamas mm-hmm. and um, all things with that. And you did some work after your 200 um, teacher training with uh, a good friend of yours with mm-hmm. the yamas and niyamas. Can you just share a little bit about the class that you taught with that and how yeah. you incorporated that? Absolutely. Absolutely. A big, it's so interesting when you share experiences with people that different things touch different people. So my good friend that I taught these yamas and niyamas adult classes with was like, eh, like they're really cool, but that wasn't what like captured her heart. But the yamas and niyamas like so fully just connected yeah. a lot of dots for me. And so um, I had the opportunity in my 200 hour training to actually meet Deborah Dell at yes. a retreat workshop. And just, um, she wrote a fantastic book called The Yamas and Niyamas, the, I think it's Yogic Ethical Principles. And that was just an amazing experience. And so a practice that she shared with me was picking a pose for each of these ethical principles that I know we're going to go into as a way to embody and to build a relationship with these things that make the world a more peaceful place that I think kind of bring everyone to their noble goal, no matter what it was. And so we taught um, yoga classes based on those. And it was just such a, a wonderful experience to have this physical practice, but so rooted in how the physical practice of yoga can go off the mat which was yeah. wonderful. And so many people think that yoga is all about the physical postures that are mm-hmm. asanas, as we say them, or in America, they say uh, asana. I yeah. think I've heard yeah. before, but <laughs> the asana, the physical postures, it's so much more than that. It's so much more deep rooted. And I learned that in my 200 because I took my 200 at Body and Soul too. Mm-hmm. And Julia and Scott Tyson in Dubuque, Iowa, do an amazing job with their 200 teaching that it is not just about the physical postures. You know, there's the breath work, there's the meditation. And there, of course, is 
the Yama and the Niyamas. Mm -hmm. And we're going to discuss that at length because we want to spread to people these ethical practices and how and share ways that they can live their life with a rich, richer meaning through the yamas and niyamas. So we're going to dig into it, but to remind the listeners that um, yoga is an eightfold path. That there are eight limbs they call them to the practice of yoga, and the yamas are, is the first limb, and that's the moral disciplines and the restraints. And sometimes that is the hardest piece because it's the foundation we have to keep coming back to over and over again. Mm -hmm. So we're going to talk a lot about the yamas because there are five of them and we're going to talk about all five of those moral disciplines. And then the second limb are the niyamas and the niyamas are the positive duties or observances. And I find a lot more joy in practicing the niyamas (laughs) than I do the yamas because the yamas do discipline me morally and hold me to grounded, being more grounded. So we're going to talk a lot about the five niyamas too. And then the third path you heard me mention before is the asana, which are the postures, the physical poses. Um, And if you hear the word like trikonasana, which is triangle pose, you're going to hear trikana, which is triangle. And the second part, asana, means pose. So asana means pose. And then pranayama is the fourth limb, which are your breathing techniques, which is Allegra's jam as well, but <laughs> that's for a different podcast. And then number five was pratyahara, which are the withdrawal of senses. And six is dharana, which is focused concentration, which so many of us need to work on. And that's a big part of what we teach in our mindful education in the schools. And then you have dhyana, which is meditation, which... I love to talk about, but again, that's for another podcast. (laughs) And then number eight is Samadhi, which is bliss, enlightenment, or what I like to call God moments. Mm -hmm. That's what I call Samadhi is having those moments where you're like, oh, God is here and whatever God might be for you. But we'll talk more about that later Mm -hmm. in another podcast. But today we're going to discuss those first two limbs, the yamas and niyamas in great detail for our listeners. So Allegra, would you talk about the yamas first and list the first five for everybody? I would love to. What I love about this conversation even more so now is like the yamas are my jam. So when you were like the joy of the niyamas, that's where you're like, yes. But I must say a little bit something about me that it's like, ooh, give me that that self-discipline. Tell me what I can't do. I like the rules. That so. is so funny because that is like in work, I am so much more like Jordan yeah, than like you. Yeah. But that's why I gravitate towards you with work because you are so disciplined in so many ways like that. And, and that's why I gravitate towards you that, and Jordan as well. I mean, that's, that's yeah. beautiful. Yeah. And we did not discuss this ahead of time no. of this podcast that the Niyamas were my jam and the Yamas were yours. So and now that makes awesome. me feel a little bit better too. Cause yeah. I'm like, okay, in case there's some things, cause I'm like, eh, Niyamas, whatever. Yeah. Let's, let's get to this. Yeah. Awesome. Um, okay. So the five Yamas. Awesome. The first mm-hmm. one so fitting is Ahimsa or nonviolence. And I'll say the Sanskrit now, but I'll probably refer to them only. I didn't need you to do that, but thank you for doing that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just because I personally, the English word I think is is beautiful and hopefully then helps to not isolate people that might not be super familiar with Sanskrit, though the Sanskrit is like also so beautiful, but ahimsa, nonviolence. Yes. Um, the, The big one, the kind of the one that I think the rest of the yamas and yamas really sit on top of. Yeah. Um, satya is truthfulness. Number two, asteya, non-stealing. Brahmachara, right use of energy, or I've heard it called non-excess. Mm-hmm. That's and a aparigraha, tough one. non-greed mm-hmm. or um, non-possessiveness. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So let's go back to ahimsa. Mm-hmm. So a big part of you know when I go through and work with the yamas and niyamas are really separating them by month. And I'll talk a little bit about mm. that later, how we're going to do that with our change makers on staff, but taking a month to work on each one separately to really focus in, do the work, read all about it, but ahimsa, nonviolence and practicing it. Um, what would you say to listeners is the best way to practice it? Yeah. Yeah. Um, great question for me. Mm-hmm. Cause I, I guess what I love about these is that it is so relational that each yeah. time I think you kind of spend moments thinking about nonviolence, you're going to get drawn to something else. But yeah. courage, which yeah. when I learned that was psh, 
mind blowing because yeah. you hear nonviolence and I think of peace, which is something that's really, really important to me. I know. That's um, your jam. And in some ways it, it feels passive and nonviolence kind of asks us to not make things worse, which I think is a great question for ourselves. Can we just not make things worse in situations? Um, but that nonviolence is not passive. It's it's very courageous, and it means that we have to be willing to enter into life's messiness so that yeah. we're in no way subtly causing violence to ourselves or others. Right. And that was something that when I first started learning these yamas and niyamas was, what? You're asking me to be courageous? You're asking me to, to be willing to share kind of these other aspects as well, being truthful? You're asking me to put myself out there like, ooh, that, that really did hit me. And so I find um, when I'm feeling maybe high strung, when I've had a conversation that didn't sit well, when I'm snippy to people in my life, it's usually because I'm not practicing some of these other ethical principles. Right. And what I find really helps me to get back in touch with nonviolence is doing things that scare me. Ooh. Being willing to talk to a person at the grocery store just because, which yeah. maybe can annoy people too if that's not your thing. But for me, it's it's been a practice of being brave that's helped me to know that life is calling me to to be nonviolent, to be really present with life. Yeah. And so that requires me to show up. Yeah. 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 I love that. For me, um, practicing ahimsa a lot of times is also cleaning up my side of the street mm. is something that I say. So that's also being courageous and acting with courage. And when I say cleaning up the side, my side of the street is when I do harm someone in some way, whether it be with my words or my actions or physically, not that I tend to do that, but, um, you know, is always making sure that I apologize for my side of things and try mm. to make it right so that I'm not leaving my street messy and, and thus leaving the street for the rest of the world messy. Um, so that's one way that I always think of when I think of Ahimsa is doing that in a small way. And the other thing that I think of too is with bugs and spiders. And I'm not kidding, oh. like in small ways, like we can practice ahimsa where it's not causing harm. Um, I know it's so silly, but like when I see a little bug in the studio, like I wanna pick it up, not all bugs, but most bugs, like put it on a sheet of paper and put it out in the world and just know that I practiced ahimsa in a little small way mm -hmm. that can maybe, that bug can go nurture some other place in the earth and make you know, that I'm, I'm adding, I'm not, I'm mm. not killing. So that's, that's another way that I always think of a practicing ahimsa and no harm. So I've been there when you've done that and yeah, I love you it. Have, you I have. think it is so beautiful because it is yeah. such a subtle kind of way of acknowledging this like interconnectedness of, yeah. of all things that to be nonviolent has to apply to all areas of our life. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. I love this discussion. This is going to get so rich. Oh, I'm so, I, this is yeah, gonna get absolutely. So rich. One more thing with yeah. nonviolence yeah. too that I just think is so important is that it it has to start with us, and I think uh, that that is yeah. is so so important. And I love that you brought up cleaning up your side of the street because in yeah. a similar way, I think the root of our love has to come from inside of us. And so if we're not filling up that wellspring, if we're not connected yeah. to capital L love, which has to include ourself, yes. then we are going to project hurt onto other people. And so we might not even see all the ways that we're adding to violence in this world by simply just not allowing ourselves to to be, to just like leaving ourselves alone in a lot of ways. So, I love that, Allegra. And I love how you said love with a capital L. Oh yeah. Cause it is, it, it is, is. Mm -hmm. it's the universal language. Yep. Absolutely. Yeah. So the second yama is, um, truthfulness, satya. Mm -hmm. So practicing satya for me is of course always being truthful, but knowing also when my truth can cause harm, you know, something that we always say at challenge to change is speak your truth. But with that, you know, behind it is always falling back on Himsa, yeah. you know, and not causing harm. Um, you know, you want to be truthful to yourself. You want to be truthful to those that you love. But sometimes when your truth can cause hurt, I mean, that is where you always have to think, 
where, what do I say and how do I say it? So mm-hmm. I am speaking with the capital L of love, not what I need best. It's always thinking about how can my words and my actions cause harm and falling back on himsa. So for you, what is, what is Satya? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I love what you just said because it has to be truth. And I yeah. think um, for myself, not that I'm a dishonest person, but oftentimes the back to courage, like yeah. truth isn't comfortable or it can't yeah. always be. And so it really, for me, has been a lot about trust, about trusting that my relationships will thrive if I share honestly and openly that they won't cause harm. Because I think I'm a lot more prone to like, I'm not going to say anything because I don't want to upset them. I don't want to yeah. ruin their day. So I'm just going to, yeah. I'll figure it out. Right. right. And, and there's some I think beauty and seeing that interconnectedness, but often I think it causes distance as opposed to connectedness. And so for me, truthfulness has really been a practice of courage. And then I love nonviolent communication, a a practice that I did when living in community a few different times that I've lived in community and being willing to say what you did hurt me. This is how I feel. And also this is what I want to do to repair our friendship. Um, and then allowing the other person to do the same. So I think allowing courage to say what you need and then having equal courage to sit in another person's experience with that truth as well. I love um, that. Yeah, which I don't do very well, like ever. But I, I mean, <laughs> we sometimes have to have hard conversations. It's part of working together. It's part of being in a community, like in a different sense, a mm-hmm. work community. And it's necessary. But sometimes I feel like when you have those hard conversations, you come to the other side stronger. Always. You, know? you yeah. always do. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 As long as it's done with that capital L love on mm-hmm. both sides and we're falling on these moral and ethical standards and practicing them in our own lives too. Absolutely. And something that I think you've done so well, Molly, and something I've learned from you is having a shared goal at the end of connection. So yeah, let's everyone sit and say our truth and let's allow that space and then know that at the end of this, we do have to make a decision or we have to like move forward. But the hope and the goal is that we're all moving forward together, even if we don't agree. So holding that two people's truth could seemingly be intention, um, but that we're, we're going forward together. So what does that look like? Yeah. Yes, exactly. Mm -hmm. Ah, love it. So we have ahimsa, satya, number three, asteya, Mm -hmm. non-stealing, non-stealing. This one I feel like for me has always been a little bit easier because I'm not a stealer because I always think (laughs) of the kid in the grocery store stealing something and people will say, you know, you know, girlfriends, you know, have you ever stole something? And I always go immediately to the physical sense of stealing something. And it's not always what this means. Mm -hmm. I mean, the way that I've practiced this in the past when I've taken a month long to really work on Astea was not stealing of people's time or, mm. or words or trying to one up their words. And by stealing their time, I mean not being late. You know, um, mm. my first husband, Kyle, always said, if you're not five minutes early, you're five minutes late. And I always really stuck to that. And my now husband, Tom, really (laughs) taught me a lesson too one time when I was late about, hey, if you're going to be late, you know, make sure you call Mm -hmm. and just let us know so we know you're safe. So those are the ways that I really practice Astea in my life when I really focused on it for that one month. But the way that I'm constantly, constantly working on it right now is not stealing of people's words or trying to one-up them. So if you told me a story about... Allegra going to Disneyland or Allegra went to Ireland for her honeymoon, not trying to say, well, when I went to Ireland, Mm, this is what mm -hmm. happened to me, but truly listening to your story and feeling your story with you and just holding space for you while you tell your, your truth of Ireland. So what, what is the stay for you and how have you practiced it? Yeah. Yeah. I, I think that was yeah. was so beautifully said because I think it is so much more than physical. It's all of the little subtle ways that, like you said, we steal people's time and energy. Um, 
And so you said it perfectly. So maybe I'll just add another practice yeah. that yeah, was taught so. to me was a lot about reciprocity Ooh. and how we steal from the earth in a lot of ways. Um, you are so good at being <laughs> mindful of that, where my mind goes to other... Thank you. Talk more about that, please. Yes. I am yes. by no means an expert yeah. uh, on, on any of that, but I do... I think Estea has touched me in a lot of ways, and it's one that is continuing to grow within me, is this really the way that it connects to gratitude. So in a lot of different cultures and particularly um, indigenous tribes will offer something to the land when they are harvesting things from the land. And this looks a lot of different ways. And I would love to learn more just about this practice, but it's certainly a practice that I think um, I have tried to reciprocate, not only when I am out in nature, um, but just with with all things in my life of not demanding or feeling like life owes me anything, yeah. um, because what a what a act of stealing to be always trying to grasp. And so, practicing reciprocity, giving back freely, trusting in abundance, and and really being willing to just accept all with gratitude. And so, um, this is a practice that. When I'm gardening at my house, I'm trying to be really mindful of the way that I am in relationship with my land. Um, it can look in a lot of different ways. But yeah, just something that has been, in addition to what you said, really, um, really taught me or Estea has really taught me. I love that, Allegra. And I love to where it goes back to just really caring for our earth. You've always been so mindful of recycling. And that is something where we can take action Mm. today. I mean, we really tend to, as Americans, take up space. I love being an American, but we do just having been in a foreign country, similar to you this last summer, we see how we have bigger houses. We have bigger paychecks. We, Mm -hmm. we have bigger food sizes yeah. and, um, we don't always tend to really think about what the earth is giving us and what we're taking from it and stealing from it. And one action step we could take is to be mindful of, you know, our boxed food and taking care of the boxes and being mindful of, could we put this in glass instead Mm, and be mm -hmm. mindful of that? Are there any other practices that you would add to that, that people could take away at this moment and practice (sighs) Estea? I mean, there's so many good ones. You mentioned gardening. I mean, gosh, that's such a good way to, to do that and not be of so much, um, and Americans. And that's, it's kind of going into our next one too, that we're going to talk about. And just real quick, I do think I have one, which is really, um, water consumption in general is a practice that, no, you like not flushing your toilet after mellow yellow, like yes. is not going to save anybody. It's not going to instantly give clean water, but the practice of taking shorter showers for me mm. is a big one, um, has really just put into perspective a connectedness with those that are, I believe like my brothers and sisters that go without water. And so no, it doesn't directly affect them but in a lot of ways it's my own little prayer of I see and feel what a privilege it is to have water and so this is just my little way of offering just kind of an acknowledgement of nothing else because it's not like oh I'm so like privileged it just really is a connection of somebody else on this earth um, lives a very different experience than me and so kind of a way that I try to feel connected yeah. Just when I think I can't have more respect for you, I do. <laughs> like having practices like that be prayers. I mean, that's what's more beautiful than that. Yeah. And it goes back to capital L love that I think yeah. I've spent a lot of my life doing things because I wanted to be good and I still do and feeling a lot of guilt. But man, oh man, these practices have really influenced my life, I think, so deeply because it's helped me to do the things that I know are right, but to do them out of love as opposed yeah. to. I have to do this or I want to be a good person, which are also good and noble um, goals, but just trying to do those little things so that going back to Ahimsa, like everything that you're doing is for peace, Mm -hmm. is in connection to peace. Yeah. And goodness, do I feel better, you know? Yeah. (laughs) Wow. Oh, I love these. I love this conversation too, that it's creating. So number four is Brahmacharya, Mm -hmm. the right use of energy. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yes, I would love to. I love that this one in particular 
Um, this was my favorite when I did that little Yama series yeah. to teach because um, in Deborah Adele's book, she talks about this being walking with God. Mm. So are you willing to experience each part of your day as if it is sacred? Yeah. And so beneath that is all these actions of the right use of energy. So what are ways that we dole our life through what we eat how we move our bodies, how we spend our time Mm -hmm. that stop us from seeing life as sacred because it really is. And then what are those actions kind of in the niyamas that allow us to connect to that vitality of life? And so this to me, a a big question is, can I honor all as sacred? And that's, that's a, an imperative or a question that I, I do bring to my morning when I, when I practice in the morning, not every day, but when it speaks to me, because I think it's such a, a potent question of today, can I honor it? Can I honor all things as yeah. sacred, the mundane? Can I honor myself as sacred um, as opposed to, OK, I got to get through this meeting so I can get to this thing. Um, it really asks us to be intentional and to be connected to the gift of today. Right. And so often we think through our day in the morning Mm. and we think, what am I most not looking forward to? And that's the thing you tend to go "Uh," about. But it's like, no, every moment, every moment of your day is sacred. And there's going to be some sort of connection that comes out of that "Eh," that -hmm. takes you back to living the best version of yourself. And there's a lesson to be learned in that moment. Yeah. So I love that. For me, when I practiced brahmacharya, and I really, I mean, I constantly am practicing it, but when I really focused in on it every day in my journaling and reading about it and living it, to me at that time, it was giving up two things because it's not just Mm. always about giving up, but it's about the being present, you know, and giving up those things that numb you in life. And number one for me at that time was wine. I mean, Mm. I still like my glass of wine. (laughs) I'm not going to lie, but it was, are you, I would have a glass of wine and turn on Netflix at night, you know, to numb myself out, Mm -hmm. to help me forget the bad parts of the day that I didn't enjoy. And in reality, it wasn't helpful. You know, it's, it's more harmful to your body, to my heart rate variability that I keep track of very religiously since my cancer journey, but it's damaging to the cells of my body. Um, and then I'm also numbing out instead of engaging in conversations with my family and Mm. reading a book to make my mind more present and full. Um, so instead during that month when I was really working on it, I worked on not watching Netflix and reading more, which three years ago was when I really practiced this, um, for that month straight. I began to read more, which has become something that I do now. Mm. And I love to read historical fiction. That's like my jam, especially French history now. But like, oh. I know it's okay. a whole nother podcast. Some books. <laughs> yeah. But it's, it's, you know, something that has helped my mind grow. Um, because I found that that was something in my life that really took me from being the best me every moment of the day. Yeah. Yeah. Because it wasn't just what I was doing that hour at night having that glass of wine and that, um, you know, Netflix binging, you know, series. I don't even know what I was watching then, but I mean, I still enjoy Netflix, but it's like when it became a habitual habit Mm -hmm. that was taking me away from living a very present life, I decided that was my practice of brahmacharya at that time. But yeah. 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 Thanks so much for sharing that too, Molly. Cause I think See why I don't love the Yamas? No, I'm kidding. Yeah, yeah. Oh, they made me <laughs> no. stop wide. No. But yeah. how, I just love the way that you spoke about that because I do yeah. think that we often feel guilty as as people yeah. and, and that usually doesn't lead us to, to more love. And so I love the way that you even talked about this. This wasn't a punishment because you don't deserve to relax, right. yeah. that you don't deserve to watch Netflix or to have a glass of wine Mm -hmm. and it's not a you also shouldn't have a glass of wine it was a practice that you did a really a gift from you to you I know that this is going to make me feel better and so I'm willing to show up to myself in that way and I think that's just such an important reframing when we think about growing ourselves is doing it out of a gift and out of love as opposed to guilt 
um, of yeah. any kind. So I love, I love that story. Thanks. Yeah. And it also serves as a tipping point for me. So when I know, Ooh, this is starting to get out of balance a little bit mm. for me living my best, most present life, then I need to reel it in and focus on, you know, this part of living my moral and ethical standards of the yamas. Yes. So yeah, yeah. Love Let's it. move into that fifth mm-hmm. yama because I feel like we could, I could talk about my All practices of, of brahmacharya because <laughs> that was, that was a big learning point for me when I practiced that. A paragraha, non-greed or excess. Uh-huh. So for me, um, you're going to give a beautiful explanation, I know, of what this practice is. But for me, it was online shopping, Allegra, oh. and restraint of that. Mm. So I found at that time I was really doing um, practicing greed in that way. Mm. Um, and it was the ethical practice of pulling back from that because just because you can afford it or, you know, it, just because, you know, a meeting fits in your schedule does not mean it has to go there. And so it's it's practicing not having that excess in your life that keeps you busy, keeps you numb again. Mm-hmm. Um, but that was a big practice for me of, of a paragraha. But Will I'm you gonna, just repeat what you said? I think you said something about if a meeting, I if you know. have a space for a meeting. Yeah. Tell me more about that. So... I heard a friend say this probably five years ago, and it lit up my world. Mm. And it is just because something can fit in your schedule does not mean it has to go there. So if there's a meeting that you feel, oh, I should take this, and it fits perfect here, I will have two minutes to breathe afterwards Mm -hmm. before the next thing, doesn't mean it can go there. Yeah, You know, it's okay to have space in your schedule. It's okay to have long, lengthy nights, which I'm coming into with my kids going away to college, Mm -hmm. of space and time. And um, I have a very close group of girlfriends for a long time were saying to me, like, you're always busy doing this or busy doing that. And I think that was something I wore as a badge of honor. So hearing this five years ago, just because something fits in your schedule does not mean you have to do it was powerful. Yeah. yeah. Just hearing you say it was really powerful. Yeah. yeah. And that is certainly, I think, what kind of non-possessiveness has, has meant to me yeah. is is subtracting um, things from your life yes. and being willing to not be attached. And I love that you talked about the material because I think it's such a good place for many of us to see what is kind of abstract as concrete. What are physical things that I'm holding on to? Um, and I, I am not an online shopper, but a thrift shopper and a hoarder of that kind. And so it's like, <laughs> I love how you call yourself a hoarder. Cause I cannot imagine that. Allegra. Oh yeah. Well, <laughs> I know. And I'm, I'm not to the extreme, but I certainly, I love pretty things and I yeah. love, um, a lot of things about the practice of buying things, which is not a bad mm-hmm. thing, but has, has been a really great kind of mirror. Like, well, why, why am I so just in love with this feeling of collecting things. Yeah. Um, and it's nothing like bad, but it is just, okay, what, what by doing this, am I not able to receive? I love that visualization. Yeah. She had her hands clasped when I'm holding on to something and then am I not allowing in and opening your hands? It's so, it's so true. Mm-hmm. It's so true, Allegra. And something I love about this in particular is the way that, um, my breath, that's been my main practice Mm -hmm. of this idea is can we trust that life is going to provide just like we trust another inhale coming from an exhale. And so oftentimes when I'm sitting in a breath practice, maybe before a yoga practice, that's what I'm thinking about is just this idea of trust, this, I am not going to try to possess this moment. I'm going to be willing to let go and then to feel the next moment, to feel it all in its splendor and then be willing for the next moment to come as well. And this has been so potent to me or pertinent to me in relationships because we often put expectations. I often put expectations that someone who has made me feel a certain way, my partner, for example, (laughs) one day, that then he's in a bad mood. He's not allowed to be in a bad mood because now I'm in a bad mood, right? There's so many little ways that we possess our image of other people, our reality of other people, yeah. our expectations of other of other people, and so I think that's something that ooh, 
is is big for me right now a lot just in my in my journey of being the best version of myself is letting go and letting the moment letting people be just as they are not needing to possess them and you know sometimes like girl and I've said this too many times you're so wise and you're 27 <laughs> years so wise and you just taught me something that's going to ring in my mind the rest of tonight and probably when I drive to Colorado to my cousin's wedding this weekend, mm. it's going to ring true to me and I'm probably going to journal on it is trusting that this moment is what it is. Like you're trusting that the exhale will come from the inhale. Yeah. That was beautiful. Thank you, Deborah Adele. That is not my, my word. That's a Deborah Adelism. Out Deborah of all these Adelism. quotes I have in my journals of hers, I don't recall that one uh, because you know why? I'm trusting that was supposed to come from you. That's what, <laughs> absolutely. And that's, you know, all of this, it's like, it's yeah. not, oh, I learned yeah. what non-possessiveness means. I mean, these are things that I think we're called to be in relationship with. And so a relationship is dynamic. We have to allow um, and trust yeah. the different ways. So good. I love that because that really is a practice that is, has stuck with me as well and continues to just grow. So, yeah. Oh gosh. You know, I think it's not that I dislike practicing the yamas. I think they were harder for me Mm. to practice when I was diligently working on each one for a month at a time because I did release a lot of isms in my personality that I felt a little shame and guilt about, you know, Mm. the online shopping, the wine drinking, the Netflixing, the numbing out. And it invited and changed me the most. And sometimes, as we know, change can be scary. (laughs) Mm -hmm. But it also, you know, just talking through this with you in this podcast makes me realize the growth that I had and what I have not allowed to come back into my life by Mm -hmm. practicing these yamas. So thank you for this conversation. Oh my gosh, thank you. Yeah. Yeah, I've learned so much already. Just, I could talk about this stuff forever. Uh, and let's, <laughs> let's. All right. <laughs> so let's move into the Niyamas. Yeah, your jam. My jam. Mm-hmm. Well, th- I had a little more fun with it. You know, <laughs> I did. Um, so can you share for us the five Niyamas Absolutely. in the best way you can? Because Sanskrit, as we know, can be difficult and we Americanize everything. I always say in our 200s, you know, trainings, and I just recorded a lot of the voiceovers for our Mm -hmm. um, coming online 200. And I said every time, you know, I know I'm not going to be perfect in my pronunciations, but I'm darn, I'm going to try my best. We're going to try our best. Yeah, (laughs) absolutely. Absolutely. So the first one is saucha or cleanliness purity. Um, Santosha contentment, the tapas discipline or burning desire. Svadhyaya. Yes. yes. Yeah. I mean, that's how I pronounce it. Svadhyaya. Lovely. Self-study or self-reflection and study of spiritual texts. Ishvara Pranidhana. Surrender to a higher power. You know how many times I had to pause that voiceover and go back and redo <laughs> that? You did it beautiful. Oh, goodness. So thank you for that. Oh, yeah. I sure did try. <laughs> And like you said, I mean, the words are so potent. This is such a beautiful tradition that we are able to participate in. And so certainly trying to honor that in in some of these things. Right. Yeah. So the first one, Saucha, Mm -hmm. cleanliness. Can you share with the listeners a little bit about what the practice of Saucha is? Sure. And then I'll share how I practice it. Okay, I love it. I I loved um, this one almost as this bridge from the yamas to the niyamas because purity cleanliness in a lot of ways is a little bit of like um a restraint right in the sense of trying to um clean up our side of the street in a lot of ways i think my current relationship with purity is really thinking about my thoughts um thinking about that kind of autopilot Mm -hmm. um that's icky and gross and is often really critical and judgmental of myself and others in the world. Um, that's, I would tell you different. I would tell you how awesome you are every day. So oh. you just come to me when you doubt that. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Sounds good. Well, it's amazing how many times those thoughts happen without me even noticing. Yeah. yeah. Um, and so I love that purity or cleanliness really calls me to, to focus up that those things matter. Mm-hmm. Um, and that there are so many ways for me to be purely with the moment. Yeah. Um, and having those just autopilot thoughts, which we naturally have. I mean, we know 
80%, more than 80% of our thoughts are going to tend to be negative. Yeah. It's our brain's way of keeping us safe. It's a beautiful function. Um, but one that it's really important for me, I found that it really helps me to be purely in the moment, yeah. um, to be fully myself, to bring myself fully um, without the yeah. kind of baggage of my expectations, of my critiques, my judgments. Um, and so that often comes in journaling in the morning and yeah. doing yeah. a process. I can't think of if there is an official name, but I set a timer and I don't lift my pencil off the paper and I just allow my thoughts to go onto the paper. I love that. And sometimes I close it and I don't look at it. Sometimes I reread it. Um, but there's no judgment in that practice. So I'm not allowed to stop whatever I'm thinking goes on paper. And that has been a really powerful practice of being purely with myself. There's no judgment yes. here. Even if I write things that are ugly, that I don't like, that are messy, um, that I, I want to show up and just be really honest about where, where I'm at. So I love that. And there's so much, so much powering and power and journaling and getting those thoughts from your mm-hmm. head out through your heart, through your fingers. Cause your, your fingertips, I always say are an extension of your heart. Mm. That's why we hug people so we can bring our hearts together. And so when you journal, you get what's going on in your head. It brings down through the emotional center and it brings it out mm. through the fingertips Beautiful. and not lifting your pen is perfect because even if you're writing Mary had a little lamb, you know, you are still getting something out there in your oh, writing. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I think there's so many, the first time I did that, I saw all the subtle ways that I was, oh, that letter looks horrible. Oh, I didn't spell that right. Is there a yeah. comma there? Why don't I know whether there's a comma there? Oh goodness, gosh forbid, if I think the word definitely, why can't I learn how to spell this word, right? Like there's all these subtle things yeah. that when you, when you, take that action of, no, I'm just going to do this without any of that. It's really powerful. So that's all really abstract. So I'm excited to hear if you're. Mine were thoughts too, but also words. Mm. And that's really, it was my thoughts and my words because I mean, I am blessed enough to have a cleaning lady (laughs) because I have four kids or, you know, I don't know now that they're going to school, that means maybe I need to do it myself, but no, 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 Saucha, whatever. I practiced it with thoughts and words Mm. at that time. Thoughts, um, again, critical thoughts of self. So I have named my critical thought process and her name is Jude, Mm. J-U-D-E. And sometimes I sing to her to make it funny, to change those thought patterns like, hey, Jude, don't make it sad. You know, like, come on, Jude, get Mm -hmm. out of my head. And so I call her Jude and um, I talk to her sometimes, uh, most times out loud and just try to ask her why she's doing that. I mean, why are you, Jude, why are you here? Why are you in putting these negative thoughts? Like Molly's a good person. Molly, Molly is a hard worker. Molly, you know, try to mm. try to cancel out a lot of things that Jude tells me. So that is one of the practices to clean up that because when my thoughts are better, then my confidence is better, then my kids are happier, my spouse is happier, my workplace is happier. Mm-hmm. So knowing that my practice of Saucha really began with my thoughts. The what sec- a beautiful yeah. practice. I Thanks. love that. And I yeah. think such a great invitation to bring to to a space of meditation. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. to bring in the Beatles. I mean, any way you can. why not? Right? Yeah. Because why not? Oh. <laughs> and a little humor because, I mean, when I start singing that, my husband will be like, oh, what's going on? You know, like, because he'll hear me sometimes in the shower be like, Jude, you know. Mm. Oh, and what a way to say, <laughs> yeah. hey, Jude, like, I'm not going to take you that seriously. Yeah. You're saying these things and like, you know, I'm going to be a little lighthearted about this. Yeah. Yeah. And I do share it. So anybody's welcome to take Jude's name. And I did learn that in my 200 from Julia Tyson. I was going to ask if you Because had. she has one that she calls, I can't remember. but I know it, but should I share yeah. it? Yeah. Oh, do you, I think she'd be okay with it's it. It's Damien. Damien, that's right. Oh, Damien, yeah. I love that. Okay. <laughs> oh, yeah. no, I, yeah. I, this is such, I need to go back and name mine. Yeah. Yeah. I, and I hadn't named it for years mm-hmm. until I really sat down and practiced Saucha. And I realized 
unbeknownst to me, sometimes out loud, I would just say, Hey Jude. So it was like spirit was saying like, this is your, but I think I just would have that song on my head because I mean, it's a sad song you're playing in your head, you know, I mean, the Beatles knew what they were talking about. Mm -hmm. The second way with my words, cussing. (laughs) I can't believe you're talking to me about this. (laughs) Allegra and I talked about this before because, um, when I was really practicing that this three years ago, my kids were really coming into the experiment of using Mm. the words. And I was in a new place as a mother with that. Um, because I always said to them when they were younger, you can hear it, but you can't say it. You know, I had always told them that because I mean, I'd have friends around and I'm not going to police how people talk in my house or in my family. And, you know, I'm like, Hey, you know, some people say it, but you say it, but you're, you can hear that, but you're not going to say it. And then once they got into like middle school, you know, they started to experiment with it. They hear it in school, you know, they hear it from their teachers and Mm -hmm. it's part of the way our world is changing. And, but for me, it was, it was becoming like really bad. Like I was saying it more often I was saying at work and it would offend some people. Mm. And so I was cleaning it up somewhat, but knowing that it is still part of the identity of who I am, like I do have a sailor mouth sometimes and that's okay. And that's part of me. And Jude's not going to tell me different. Uh But when I did practice Saucha for that month, you know, besides naming it to tame it through, you know, my thoughts and talking to Jude, it was also like, Hey, let's clean up the language Mm -hmm. a little bit. So my journaling that month in my journal had a lot of cuss words in it because I wrote them instead of saying them, Allegra. I love that. Okay, thank heavens because I was like, oh gosh. (laughs) I mean, I I love that practice and I love the way that you explained it too because I do think in a lot of ways it is tied to identity. Yeah. I have a sailor mouth myself. Yeah. It's something that was really liberating for me in my youth because I wasn't allowed to swear growing up and so there was this like really beautiful kind of I I'm allowed to be viewed by people as not being perfect and swearing I think Mm -hmm. kind of helped be like this I can I can disrupt things a little bit yeah I love how you've centered it on relationships because I do think in certain spaces it isolates and it doesn't connect when you use those type of words and so just um having that conversation with the relationship with cuss words in a yeah. lighthearted way of, ooh, where is this serving me and where is this not serving yes. me? So that it's not autopilot. Right. Yeah. And yeah. it all goes back to causing no harm. Absolutely. You know, and me saying the F word in some way, shape, or form in a work setting would probably cause someone harm by making their heart var- variability not be good mm. because it might start I a love lot. it. It could be that <laughs> subtle. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. So, yeah. 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 Oh, thanks for okay, sharing those. so back to um, our niyamas, uh, santosha, contentment. Yeah. So, talk a little bit about the practice of santosha mm-hmm. as the ethical standards. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, the call to to be happy with what with what yeah. we have, and particularly, I love the way that all of these really connect because it's something that I kind of talked about with non-stealing as well, Mm -hmm. is this idea of we're not going to steal or feel like we're owed anything. And I think contentment is very, very similar of sitting with what is and being content with it. Um, And particularly my practice of this is non-seeking. So yeah, uh, not looking to the next thing when I'm in the present moment, because in a lot of ways that's stealing joy from myself. Yes. Um, Yes. Seeking for the next thing to fix, the next thing to perfect. Um, Not spending my brain space thinking about the next thing to plan. Mm -hmm. Um, And I do all of these things absolutely horribly. I'm a planner. I, I can just think of an instance this past week where life disappointed me. And instead of being content with what was happening, I did a bunch of seeking for all the ways that I could fix it. Um, and it honestly just made me really miserable for the whole day. Yeah. And so I think that's what this Niyama calls us to is to experience joy with the reality of what things are and not trying to shift it in any way. Um, you just made me feel a lot better about how I practiced it. Cause I wasn't <laughs> quite sure, uh, you know, according to, uh, cause I read a Deborah Adele's book, mm-hmm. the Yamas and Niyamas as well. And I think she's amazing 
it didn't really call this to action, but this is how I practice Santosha was putting down my phone and working on my screen time. You know how you get that message every week that tells you how many hours you've been on your phone every day, Yep. <gasps> you know, and trying to get that lower and lower and lower because it was stealing me from joy, like you said, mm-hmm. from being content in the present moment, having conversations once again with my kids, with my family, petting my dogs, taking my dogs for a walk oh. without my phone, mm-hmm. um, without podcasts in my ears. A podcast are great, but without something yeah. of excess again, and just being content in the moment content. with the air, with my breath, with my dogs, with whatever it was and getting that screen time down. Cause I tell you what, I can be a scroller. I can be a scroller. And you know, I, I was sharing earlier before the podcast with you about how I put the videos up on the TikTok every day for challenge to change Mm -hmm. and on YouTube. And I have to be really mindful in the morning that I have a set time to do that, or it can take me down a rabbit hole and I'm late for my morning workout. And then I'm stealing from my friend's time. Mm. So, you know, it's phone usage was really important to me in disciplined and I know when it comes to excess, it's time to bring the Santosha into my life yeah. a little bit more. Yeah. yeah. Oh, I love that. And I love that it, it touches on so many things that we talked about, the non-stealing. Yeah. And then also this idea of what are we missing in the moment if we're trying to numb with this thing? Because yeah. if, I mean, I'm a scroller too. Yeah. And it's it's amazing that it's almost a daze sometimes where I'm, I'm bored for just a moment and then somehow my phone's in my hand and I'm on a website yeah. and just that really unconscious way that we can't just be content. And so I love that you brought up the breath too. Yeah. Like, Ooh, if we just sat and we breathed, like how much more joy would we feel not seeking right. the next thing? Yeah. Yeah. Huh. Oh, love it. So good. Okay, tapas, discipline or burning desire? Mm-hmm. Talk a little bit about that, Allegra. Oh my gosh, I want you to talk about it first. <laughs> so for me, when I, you know, I tapas to me was always a physical practice because before I knew much about the yamas and niyamas, because you hear of like tapas yoga classes where it's hot yoga and you sweat and you burn off whatever, but that's how I always visualized it. But it's it's burning off something that, for me, it was burning off something that no longer really served me, Mm. um, was how I viewed it because I, I believe that there's so much birth that can happen in fire. You know, Mm. when you're put to the flame and you feel that burning sensation, um, that's where the change, the metamorphosis happens. That's where the butterfly comes out of the chrysalis and begins anew. And so, for me, when I practiced tapas, it was coming back to a physical practice for me. Um, I, at that time I was really into, um, you know, running and exercising in other ways and kind of avoiding the physical practice of yoga and, um, you know, love meditation. I love meditation, but you just sit there (laughs) because I think I was fearing a little bit what would happen when I added the movement in, you know, Mm. um, and that running brought in some burning sensation in my right hip, in my sciatica area. And I found so much solace in, in the poses, in the asana through this and burning off whatever it was that I felt I needed to run from in my life. Um, and sat in it and sat in that pigeon pose that really hit that, um, like solar plexus sciatica area Mm. and learning to talk to my muscles and learning to talk to my nerves and learning to talk to, you know, Jude and in pigeon pose, and this is just something that came up in my journaling of tapas is I, and I say it aloud in my yoga practices that I teach, I say to my hips in pigeon pose, I love you. I hear you now, please let go. Mm. Like, please burn through and let go because we hold so many issues in our tissues and so much as females in our hips. Mm -hmm. And I found that speaking, not just to Jude, but to my physical body also helped me to burn off what was excess that I didn't need. So that's for me how I 
kind of took it. This, do you see why I love the Niyama, Niyamas a little more? Because I, I just took it. so much liberty with it, and that's yes. me. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And it's like it was like a creative process yeah. for you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you know me. That's my nest. That's your jam. Yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. That's a yeah. that's a Molly Ness yeah. thing. Yeah. Which of course, then it's it's beautiful that that wisdom comes through with your teaching too. Because of yeah. course it does. Because it demands to be shared that light. Yeah, yeah, that's beautiful. And you know, I think. No, I know. When I was really working on tapas that month, it wasn't it wasn't something that I said, okay, I'm coming back to my practice. Like it was naturally occurring. And it's because what I've done when I've practiced it month by month is I've read it and then decided this is how I'm gonna practice it. Mm. But tapas really came up in my journaling of how it decided it was gonna practice me, you know? Yeah. As it does. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, beautiful. Yeah. Beautiful. Yeah. Tapas is one that I struggle with. Is it? Yeah. It I is. Mean, yeah. 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 And maybe that's why I took the liberty. <laughs> no, I love, I mean, I love it. I love it. Yeah. I, um, I love, I think I always took tapas as, as self-discipline. So being mm-hmm. willing to kind of be uncomfortable or do things that you don't want to do yeah. for a greater good. Yeah. And of course there's like fasting practices and things like that, that I think can be a good fire. Mm-hmm. Um, but oftentimes we're so associated to, to guilt of my youth that I think when I read tapas, I was like, Ugh, I don't, I don't really want that anymore yeah. right now, or that's not what's speaking to me. Um, and so tapas, I love that you talk about the, the fire and, and mostly the being willing to stay. Cause I think that's what my experience with tapas has been is this idea of feeling maybe really uncomfortable or feelings that are more unpleasant and instead of numbing and all the ways that we've kind of talked about that we do being willing to be refined by those intense feelings by the disappointment and staying in those just a little bit longer for me personally my instinct is to numb or mostly to fix to say I don't have to feel this anxiety because I'm just going to do all these things perfectly Um, And so being willing to sit in those uncomfortable feelings or unpleasant feelings. And I love that fire refines um, is is a practice that I have been kind of leaning into in a lot of ways. And I love that you brought up a physical pose because my physical pose for um, I kind of have my own little flow that I do with the yamas and yamas, my tapas uh, pose is. Oh goodness, cow pose. Yeah. So kind of this this looking up and I love picturing like a waterfall and me being a stone um, and that water refines stones like at the bottom of the waterfall. It makes them really shiny and pretty and smooth. And so I love this imagery, whether it's fire or water, of letting life refine me as opposed to running away from things that are hard and I don't need to create things that are hard life's going to be hard right um and so just being willing to stay kind of in that mess yeah that Yeah. yeah and you did such a beautiful job of saying that such a beautiful job of bringing back the liberties that I took too, is that, you know, moving away from the running practice, you know, and Mm -hmm. and coming into the staying practice into the physical asana practice and acknowledging how we have maybe damaged our bodies a little bit and saying, I love you. I see Mm -hmm. you now, please let go and let me be in, let me be in you. But, Oh, Allegra, you are so wise. Oh my gosh. You are so wise. Um, So Svedyaya, self-study or self-reflection and study of the spiritual texts. For me, um, that really related again into coming into my meditation practice. Um, So many of our listeners probably know too that I went through a cancer journey that started almost two years ago Mm -hmm. and started a, a strong meditation practice, always had a floating meditation practice. And when I was practicing Svedyaya, I had a strong meditation practice that month too. But it, it's something that I always allowed to slip away, but not since I came to that cancer diagnosis because it was, holy cow, like this is real. And what is the number one thing I know to do is to relieve stress and to let me live in this present mm. moment is to get on my meditation cushion 
And with that, I have moved away from calling it meditation practice, Allegra. I don't know if I've shared this with you, but I call it my quiet time in the morning. Mm, Okay. Because, um, sometimes I think when people hear meditation practice, they think you're sitting perfect Mm. and your hands are on your lap and you're just look like this picture of peace. But for me, um, my quiet time is what I've called it. It has parts of that, but a big part of it too is reading those spiritual texts, reading inspirational pieces, um, that help me to be a better version of myself. And it's also, you know, breath work. It also has some movement in it, especially if my sciatic is kicking up mm-hmm. again and I need to talk to my um, body, you know, I will do that. Um, it, and it also incorporates journaling as well. And so I don't call it just a medi- I don't call it a meditation practice anymore. Mm-hmm. I call it a quiet time. I, and and oftentimes it has space where when I'm doing reading of those spiritual texts and doing my seated practice, it has times that come up where people come to my head and my heart. And I know that is spirit saying, reach out to them, mm. you know, let them know that you're thinking of them. And just an instant, I have a friend who is having her seventh child and is really struggling right now. And I, one day she was on my mind and my heart in my quiet time. And I reached out to her and I do believe, and she said, Oh my gosh, thank you. This is exactly what I needed. And we connected at a deeper level. And I do believe that God puts people in your life and those thoughts, those moments of Samadhi to help you reach out and connect with people and practice capital L love. And so, um, that all happens through spiritual reflection, meditation, self-study, journaling, quiet time, whatever it might be for you. So that's how I practice it. Oh my gosh. Beautiful. Yeah. 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 Ooh, you're making me want some quiet time right now. <laughs> I mean, I, I just love this, this openness of, of being a vessel too, which is beautiful. Yeah. 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 I think, um, I'll just piggyback off that. Yeah. Spending alone time is, is huge. The self-study, the being willing to be at peace with myself, um, not putting masks on. Cause I think we often do that with ourselves too. Like, Oh, I did something like was short with someone. And instead of thinking about it, it's like, Oh, well I was hungry. And then you just kind of like move on, which maybe you were hungry, but (laughs) I, I really see this as entering into a really intimate relationship with myself. So just like we were given a lot of marriage advice. I'm newly married of like go on a date every week because you have to prioritize that, that time. I think about that with myself, that the longest relationship I will be in, in this life is with myself. And so I need to prioritize that relationship as well. And that means showing up for myself when I'm feeling those ways. It means being willing to listen and to offer myself kindness in a lot of ways. Um, And then a big one's responsibility with that. So 99% (laughs) of what bothers you in this life is you. Um, And that, when that was said to me, was like, "Mm, I don't want to hear that truth because it's so much easier. It feels so much more comfortable. But um, in my experience, it is so true. And so learning to take responsibility to clean up my side of the street and knowing that I waste so much energy um, not doing those things. And I cause so much harm um, not doing those things. So, right. Yeah. Always goes back to causing no harm. So moving into the last Niyama, Ishvara Pranidhana, the fifth one, all about letting go, surrendering. Yeah. Surrendering to the higher power. One thing, sorry to jump right in, jump right in. But for a practice for me during this time, you know, was always, I was always, a very faith-filled person and a very spiritual person. I grew up Catholic, Roman Catholic. Um, when um, my husband died um, and went to heaven, I literally thought he went to heaven and sat next to Jesus and that's what it was. And that's okay. And then my spirituality through a life experiences, getting remarried and taking my 200 and exploring other religions of the world um, really brought me to more of a spiritual sense, mm. um, I would say. So for me, during this time was adopting a new way of identifying and being okay with my 
lack thereof organized religion and more spirituality and um, coming into naming it. And someone who was in my 300 yoga teacher training at that time, taking it with me um, when we did this journaling and really practicing each of the yamas and niyamas, named it, and this is something she heard from a teacher, was Gus, God, Universe, and Spirit. Mm -hmm. So naming her spirituality, Gus, God, Universe, Spirit. So it it encompasses, I believe, and I love that, and I adopted it because it adapts for me God as I knew God growing up, that part of Molly, the universe, as I just love to think of it, beyond us on this little earth, Mm -hmm. and then Spirit this um, ness of me, of you, the L, capital L. Um, So I really adopted that and started using that language as a practice when I was working on this Niyama. So Gus, God, universe, spirit. Love it. Yeah. Oh, thanks for sharing all that, Molly. I know you know that I also grew up Roman Catholic. And so I think that that is why the Yamas and Yamas has spoken to me so much because it has been a little bit of this bridge of my upbringing. Um, You know, that order, disorder, reorder, right? Of questioning things of of youth because life teaches you different things and spirit and love, I truly believe, calls your heart in different ways too. And so allowing that to be expansive. Um, And so, yeah, this practice has really been the surrender of curiosity, of letting life be what it is, and most importantly, letting God in. Right. Um, And so not keeping um, the idea of spirit or what connects us in a box and just being open every day by letting go all of those assumptions to to just let God in, let spirit in. Yeah. And I love that you said the naming piece because I think that's something that I've been working on and have worked on with spiritual directors in the past of, okay, if God isn't father anymore, big guy with the big beard, Santa Santa Claus kind of guy, then then how do I still feel intimate if I can't name it? And so for me, um, yeah, that was just so beautiful. I want to, I want to go in and name it now. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, again, in pigeon pose, when I teach yoga, I teach a weekly one class a week and I love teaching one class a week because I like put all my love into that one Mm. class I teach. But again, in pigeon pose, that's such a spiritual pose for me. I ask the practitioners to look over their left shoulder when they get into pigeon and honor their feminine side. And then look over their right shoulder to honor their masculine side and then tip their heads up to the ceiling to thank Gus, God, universe, spirit, whatever it may be, honor and say a prayer and then fold forth into Mm -hmm. your sleeping pigeon. So that's that's like a practice that I started when I was really practicing this um, Niyama as well. Yeah, that's why yoga is awesome. Yoga is awesome. Because it's that embodiment of yeah. those things. I mean, you can think those things, but to participate in it with that movement yeah. is just so, so powerful. Yeah. 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 The last thing, just real quick, because yeah. I just yeah, remembered yeah. of like my actual aha moment was this um, surrendering to the ego like oh. of the self and being willing to bow your ego into your highest self, your true self, that, that divine um, sacredness that I truly believe is in each person and it's what connects us. And so that's just kind of another practice where in my physical yoga practice, anytime I'm in child's pose, that's what I'm, I'm offering is the surrendering of my ego to the sacred, to the mystery that I can't define, but I believe is there. I am going to think that every time I'm in child's pose now, that was awesome. Oh, it feels so good. I don't know yeah. who shared that with me. It's not mine, but I've just loved it ever yeah. since I learned it. That's been so powerful. And so. that's what the sharing is. Like yeah. when I learned about Gus, it wasn't what she created, but she passed it down to me. But I want to pay homage to her because I didn't create it. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. I love that. Thank yeah. you. As, in my mind, be it an allegorism, but you and know, that's, that's yeah. beautiful. We're all sharing all things. <laughs> so we are, so I thank you for taking the time to go through all the yamas and oh. niyamas. And I hope all the listeners have learned a little tidbit or two on how they can practice, but our staff members at challenge to change this calendar year are going to have the opportunity to practice learning about the yamas and the niyamas one month at a time. So for 10 months, they're going to be given the opportunity to journal. Um, we have created at Challenge to Change through our 300 yoga teacher training, an amazing journal that walks through each and every 
one of the yamas and niyamas and allows you to practice it for a month through journaling. Um, and in the journal, you're able to, you know, write your gratitudes every day and you're asked some questions that are from Deborah Adele's book that reflect on that particular yama or niyama you're working on. So I'm really hopeful that all the staff members take an opportunity to um, learn a little bit. But if any of our listeners are interested as well, I hope they take that opportunity too, because we do have these journals for anyone and everyone that wants to practice. That's amazing. I I mean, I can't wait for that opportunity because it just, the relationship never ends. Everyone should love the Yamas and Niyamas as much as we do, Allegra. Well, I don't know about that. (laughs) Another name for everything, but certainly having a an ethical principle or some sort of foundation. I think it's just so important to what it means to navigate this life. So yeah, absolutely. Okay. Now it's time for the core four. Are you ready, (sighs) Allegra? Okay. And these are four questions that I ask everyone who comes on a podcast. Mm -hmm. And it's really just to share the, the whole mission of living the best version of yourself and continuing to hone that best version every day. And the first two questions are really guiding principles and they can change. Mm -hmm. But right now in your life, question number one, what are your top three core values that you hold to be true and sacred to the best version of Allegra? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I, I mean, first of all, so honored to even be thought of as the best version of myself though. I I do try it. I mean, we are on this, this road, but I think I love the values do keep me so grounded. And so my, my first one is always integrity. Mm. I just need to be a lady of my word. If I say I'm going to do something, Ooh, I'm going to do it and I'm going to do it to the best of my ability. Um, and that means showing up and it means taking responsibility, um, and doing everything that I can to, to live in the way that I want to, um, and to be really intentional about the way that I live. So that's, that's big number one. Um, number two and three are are really connected to this beautiful mother Teresa quote, Mm -hmm. um, which is if you have no peace, it is because you have forgotten that we belong to each other. Mm you have no peace it is because you have forgotten that we belong to each other and so peace Beautiful. and belonging um, the responsibility that comes with if I truly believe that we all belong to each other what does that call me to do how does that call me to wake up to sit with uncomfortableness um, to not just kind of live my own individual life but to feel that connection um, how does that mean I need to rely on other people as well yeah, to yeah. belong to other people to feel safe in that And then peace, capital P, peace, um, really connected to contentment and to the connection with the divine. If you have no peace, if you feel um, like you don't belong, like you're not home in yourself, um, I do believe that's so connected to belonging. So I love peace. Talked about a little bit. Making the world more peaceful is really important to me. Um, Creating spaces, which is the next question. So I won't (laughs) even go there yet. (laughs) Okay, you're ready? Yeah, I'm ready. What is your noble goal? Yeah, cultivate spaces to encounter peace. So I want to cultivate, create in whatever ways that I can. Um, I love the word cultivate because it if you cultivate the earth, you're cultivating something that already is and always is. And so peace is not something that we create. I think it's something that is within us. Um, peace, capital P, peace, another word for the divine, for the sacred. It's something I love that, that you capitalize it. Yeah, I gotta capitalize yeah, it because yeah, it's it's yeah. it's what's true. Yeah, so that's that's my noble goal. I love it, and I love that you can have it roll off your tongue. Mm. Um, you're the first person who said on the podcast that could do that, and Ooh. that's my goal for all of our change makers at Challenge to Change and the people we work with, whether it be workplaces, teachers, educators, whatever is for people to know their noble goal so mm. that you align to it every single day of your life. And if it doesn't align, it doesn't belong, right? Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Well, and I've just loved this opportunity because I, I truly have seen a difference in just my own kind of safety and direction of yeah. and, and purpose that my purpose, what I do can change a lot, but that truly has been something that makes me feel at home in myself. Like, ooh, if yeah. I just do one thing, I hope that I create more peace. And that's so comforting because then all the other little stuff can just go away. You do it. Just being around you, I always feel more peaceful. I hope so. (laughs) (laughs) Um, The third question of my core four is, 
Who has been someone who has inspired you to be the best version of yourself? Mm. So who can we give a shout out to in this podcast that has created the best Allegra thus far? Oh goodness, should it be someone that like I know? Because my no. mind, oh, okay, it can, can be, be like, whoever you want it to oh, be. Oh gosh, I mean, I've talked about so many teachers: yeah. Richard Rohr, Deborah Adele, Thich Nhat Hanh. But I think the big, the big one is Dorothy Day, mm. um, who is the founder of with Peter Warren the Catholic Worker Movement. Yes, um, which I've is, heard you mention her name before. Yeah, I was like, oh, she's yeah. just this amazing, amazing lady. Um, that was really radical, really into social justice, and was all about kind of spaces in which people brought more peace. And so this movement is really based on creating spaces where it's easier to be good. And I just love this idea of creating spaces where people enter them and they feel like they can be the best version of themselves, like it's easy. Um, And I've been a part of Catholic worker communities and have just felt that. And I love the way that she's a writer. So she has amazing books. Go read her books. Um, Okay, Dorothy, we're giving you a shout out. Dorothy's big. She's wonderful. (laughs) Yeah. And then the last question for this podcast is, how are you going to continue to make the world around you better than you found it today in the next hour, three hours, Mm -hmm. night, tomorrow? How, Allegra? From this conversation, I feel like it changed from when I prepared for this question. Oh, I love that. Yeah. And I think it is just, it's got to start with me. There's another great quote of Eddie Hilsom, who is this Jewish woman that wrote during the Holocaust that um, we have one moral duty and it's to create pockets of peace within ourselves, and then just trusting that that peace kind of radiates out. And that's a paraphrase, but... Um, yeah, that like I need to be way more disciplined, not need. I want to be way more disciplined about spending time with myself in the morning and setting myself up for success so that yeah. every every beautiful moment that I touch with this life really is as impactful. So and this conversation has been the, so inspiring. Can you say the quote again, Allegra? Yeah, okay. I'm, I'm not doing it justice at all. Okay, no, it's that's okay because quote, I feel like the more important part of why I want you to repeat it is this was a Jewish writer who survived Auschwitz. I don't think she did survive. I should know more about her. Okay. They, I think found her writing. Found her in yeah. During that was the her Holocaust. writing from being yeah. in Auschwitz, finding pockets of peace. I don't know if she was in Auschwitz. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. Just during the Holocaust, though, like a Jewish <laughs> woman. But she, um, I assumed. Look at how yeah. I jumped to those. Conclusions. No, that's okay. Yeah, I mean, but it truly is. Yeah. I mean, just for this woman who is fighting wow. all this, and I think in our own world we see all of this, but that our one moral duty is to create pockets of peace in ourself. And then there's all these other words, but it pretty much is like, then by doing that, we're going to change the world. Yeah. And that just feels like I can do that. And I want to do that. And I hope that for everyone as well. Thank you, Allegra. Thank you for sharing all your wisdom in your wise 27 years. (laughs) I just think you're an amazing human being. And thank you for being a change maker on our team and helping to create those pockets of peace that will spread into the larger world. So thank you. Uh, Thank you for this conversation. I'll be the best version of myself Spreading kindness and peace I'll be the best version of myself